Yes, I'd like to order your finest Uber. Oh, <laughs> hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Discriminating Gamer. Today, we're going to go ahead and take a look at Arkham Horror 3rd Edition from Fantasy Flight Games. In Arkham Horror, 3rd edition from Fantasy Flight Games, one to six players, of course, take on the role of various investigators as they move around the city of Arkham in an attempt to stop the evil Elder Ones from returning to Earth and wreaking a terrible vengeance. I don't, I don't know what their motivations are. They're just bad for people. Now, the first thing you're going to do in this game is grab a scenario sheet. This is going to tell you which monster you're going to be fighting in this game. It's also going to tell you how you're going to set up this modular board. Um, it's going to give you kind of instructions for where to place the various neighborhoods, and how they're connected by different types of streets. There's, uh, you know, residential streets and scenic streets and, and, and bridges. And then for the districts, of course, you have, you know, downtown, uptown, south side, riverside, west side story. And you're going to go ahead and each of these, each of these um, districts has different spaces. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to set all that up. You're going to arrange a mountain of card decks. There's a ton of different card decks you're going to do. Of course, you've got things like the spells and the items, which have a display you can buy from during the game. You have allies that you can acquire during the game. You're also going to have uh, an archive, which uh, with the scenario will tell you which, which cards to take out that begin, they're part of what is known as the codex. And the codex is going to drive the story here in many ways. You're also going to prepare a deck of specific monsters that you're going to use for the scenario, and you are also going to select certain investigators, which investigators you are going to play. And of course, the investigators, like these other Cthulhu games from Fantasy Flight, they each have stats. You know, they have their, of course, their health and their and their and their mental uh, damage that they can take, mental health they can take. Then you've got, of course, the stats that you you roll on. You've got, you know, observation, kind of how well you get along with other people. You've got your willpower and, and strength and all these things that you're going to roll uh, to conduct tests during the game. Now, you have those specific stats, and you're going to roll that number of dice uh, to try to roll successes. Now, you roll success on a 5 or a 6, and generally you only have to roll one success to pass a test unless the specific test says otherwise, says so you need to roll more. Sometimes the amount of successes you roll will determine whether you succeed or how you succeed in that specific test. But, as I say, this game is very story-driven. So as you progress through the game, as you, as you kind of move and, and discover clues um, and, and do all sorts of other things that the game kind of, kind of puts on you, uh, you're going to get uh, more of this codex that will be, that'll be put on you. And that codex will drive the story. Now, specifically, these are the phases the game plays out. The first thing is you have the investigator phase. The investigators can take two actions, and they can't take the same action twice. The actions that you can do are, of course, move. You can move up to two spaces, but you can also spend up to two dollars to move uh, an additional space on a one-for-one -one basis there. You can also gather resources, essentially get a job, and gain, gain a dollar for that action. And you can do a focus action. A focus action essentially lets you take a token uh, and place it on your card for a specific skill. That will give you one additional die during that uh, skill check. However, at any time, you can spend it on any kind of a skill, just get rid of it in order to get a reroll. Now, throughout the game, you're going to have doom accumulating in different spaces, and you want less doom, because more doom is kind of your timer, and it, and it kind of heralds the, the coming of the Elder God. So you want to get rid of doom, and you can do a ward test. Essentially, you're going to be testing, I think, lore. You roll the lore test, and if you're successful, you can get rid of, of uh, the doom tokens, and if you, it, it's per success, you can get rid of that number of doom tokens. And if you can get rid of two or more doom tokens on a single test, then you also get to have a... Um, uh, you can get a remnant token, which can help you later in the game. 
Of course, you can attack monsters that are in your location or move to a location and attack them. And this is just you're rolling a strength test, but of course you may have other, other items that may help you fight that monster. Essentially, the monsters on their back have kind of printed values of what it takes to defeat them as well as what damage they're going to inflict. But if you can essentially roll the number of uh, hit points that they take, then you've defeated that monster. You also can roll to evade a monster. If you're in a space of the monster and you don't want to fight it, you just want to get out of there, you have to successfully roll to evade that monster. Now, there are clues in the different neighborhoods, and you can gain some of them during encounters or through, through other methods. More on that later. And you can essentially research the clues. And to research a clue, that lets you put the clue on the scenario sheet, and that's important because Doom's also going to get on the scenario sheet. You want more clues and less Doom. You can do a trade action. A trade action is where you and another investigator in your same spot can trade items. And you can also do a component action. That is to say some of the cards you get may say action on them you can take, or the codex may have cards that say action that you can take in specific spaces or under specific conditions. Now, after all of the investigators go, then it's the monsters phase. Now, first of all, the monsters are going to move to new locations. If they come into contact with, they move into the same space with an investigator, they're going to be flipped over to their exhausted side, and those monsters are then uh, going to attack uh, any investigators they are in the same space. Essentially, they just inflict damage. What damage they have printed on their uh, cards goes to the investigator, uh, goes immediately to his sheet or any subsequent cards or, or supplementary cards that he's got that can help him. Next, you have the encounter phase. Now, depending on where you are on the board, you're going to draw a specific kind of an encounter card. Each of the locations has an encounter deck, and each of the streets, the, the different kinds of streets, will have encounter decks, uh, an encounter deck as well. And you just look for the specific section that you are on. It's very similar to Elder Char if you played that. And then you, you pass that specific test that it calls for, or do whatever it else it says, and that's your encounter for the turn. You do not draw an encounter card if you are engaged with the monster, however. Now finally you have the mythos phase. Now during the mythos phase essentially you, you uh, have a bag or a cup or some kind of op opaque container and you place a number of tokens in there, mythos tokens. Well during this phase uh, each investigator is going to reach in and draw two of these tokens. These tokens are going to have different things. They may spawn monsters. They may spawn clues in which case you're going to take cards out of the event deck and place them into the neighborhood decks. The, the top part of the neighborhood decks and the backs look just like the neighborhood decks so you never know when they're going to come up. But I'll put clues on the board. You may spawn doom in different places around the board. You may have to draw a headline card. These are newspaper headlines that of course have some various effects that will happen to the investigators usually not pleasant. You may have a gate burst. Essentially, you take the top event card, and whatever neighborhood that's in, all of the districts get a doom token. And, of course, that's not very good as well. You want to minimize those doom tokens so those gate bursts really hurt. You may also draw a blank, which means, of course, nothing happens, or you can draw a reckoning. Now, if you draw the reckoning token, some cards will say, during the reckoning, you have to do this. Like the Dark Pact is something that can really help you, but every time there's a reckoning, you've got to roll a die. And, of course, if it comes up however it says it comes up, something bad's going to happen to you. So you go around and around, you're trying to get rid of the doom, you're trying to, 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 to get the clue tokens on the card, you're trying to fight monsters, you're trying to get all this stuff done and play through those codex cards, because that's the story that's going to tell you how to defeat the monster and how to win the game. If you can successfully get through those codex cards and defeat the Elder God, then you win Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. So Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. Um, I had played the 2nd Edition... Um, a couple of times, I think only once or twice a long time ago. I think yeah, George and Holly actually uh, introduced me to uh, that game. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed it, but I thought it was just a little too cumbersome. I thought there was just a little too much going on. It just seemed like it was unnecessarily fiddly for me. So I was kind of not terribly happy with that game. I didn't like it as much as I wanted to like it, because it looks awesome. And I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. And they loved it, and I, I, I just didn't love it. Um, but I thought it was certainly certainly interesting. And then it was like a year or two later, the um, Elder Char came out. And I fell in love with Elder Char. I thought Elder Char was cool. I thought it was a, light, light, a lot like Arkham, but I thought it was more streamlined, and I liked the wider scope of the planet. And I just, I, I really ate up, up, up Eldritch. I had played Mansions of Madness 2, which I really liked, the original. And then, of course, the second edition of Mansions of Madness came out, and that was freaking awesome, and I love Mansions of Madness. And now this Arkham Horror Third Edition comes out, and it's um, you know I, I, I'm playing it, and first of all I'm setting it up, and it's a long setup, and there's a lot of stuff you gotta you gotta get out there and get right for, for this specific scenario. There's a lot of cards you gotta find, a lot of organizing you gotta do, 
And in general, I was let, not so pleased with the setup. I mean, I was I was under the impression this was going to be a more streamlined version of Arkham Horror, so I was interested in it. And it didn't feel very streamlined during the setup. It felt a lot like what I remember the original one from being. It felt very, there's just a lot going on. Is it going to be worth it? So, I was playing the game, and there's a lot of stuff here I like. I like um, the modular boards, very cool, obviously. Uh, you know, the investigators. Cool. I, I like the fact that you can play this game and you, you kind of know and understand how to play it if you've played these other Cthulhu games from Fantasy Flight. There's a lot of rules you just know. That's cool, too. I really uh, li- like that on that level it was easy to get into. The, the Codex thing is interesting, the way it builds a story. I really like games that can have creative ways to tell a story, and this one has a pretty cool system here for that. Kind of Like I say, it's kind of... Uh, a lot of setup, but but the story here payoffs is actually pretty good. Um, go ahead and you play the game, and there's a lot of die rolling, of course, for the tests, and you know that and you expect it, and it's fun and it's exciting. You take your turns, the players take their turns, and then you have the monsters phase. And of course, you got to go through and make sure all the monsters are doing their thing. And then, of course, you've got the encounter phase, where you read the encounter cards. And then, this is just like in Eldritch, and then you go ahead and you, you roll dice, you've got tests, or maybe something happens to you. And then you got that mythos phase, and you're drawing the various tokens, and then you got to manage that. And so what I'm getting at here, between your turns, there's quite a lot that happens. And I recently played uh, Donning the Purple, uh, which was a Roman Empire game. That, that I liked a lot about it, but I, I didn't like the way it felt like the game was playing you more than you were playing it. And I kind of get that same feeling from Arkham Horror 3rd Edition. I kind of feel like it's playing me more than I'm playing it. It's a fun game, generally. There's a lot going on here. There's choices. It's, it's, it's an engaging game on a lot of levels. But I wish players had a more active role. You only get the two turns. You can't repeat a turn. There's times where you really want to move far, even with your money, and you want to move further, or you want to attack twice, or you just want to get stuff done, and you need to do two actions, and the rule is you can't do the same action twice. And there's just there's just a lot in this game that makes me feel like I'm not an active participant. I'm, I'm reacting. I'm, I'm managing the game. I'm managing the AI more than I'm playing. I like this game fine. I, I, I like it for what it is. But my problem is that I like these other games better. Um, I like Eldritch Horror better than this edition. I like Mansions of Madness with the app a lot better. I mean, you, you kind of get that sense of, of, of the games playing a lot in, in Mansions of Madness, too. But in Mansions of Madness, I still feel like you've got really cool and fun decisions. You decide who to talk to and where to go. And and to me, it's just a little more rewarding of an experience and a more and it feels like a more engaging experience and when you're doing the puzzles and stuff. And and here it just it feels like the the game's got a baseball bat and it's banging you here and then you go over there and then something else is banging you there and you go over there and and it's just I, I feel like while you've got choices and, and sometimes they can be quite consequential, sometimes they just don't feel that meaningful. A lot of the game, sometimes they just don't feel that meaningful. Uh, so what I'm saying here is, you know, if you, if, if, you, if you like the Cthulhu games and you're a completist and you want to get it, this is a fun game. You'll enjoy it. You'll have fun with it. If you're kind of new to these Fantasy Flight games like this, I'd recommend getting Mansions of Madness or... or, or uh, Eldritch Horror. I think they're both superior games. Uh, I, I, I can honestly say I liked Arkham Horror. I didn't love it, not by a long shot. Um, it doesn't feel that streamlined. That's my other big, big criticism here. I was hoping this game would play a lot smoother than the previous edition of Arkham Horror. And maybe it does a little bit, but not nearly as much as I was hoping. Recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for Arkham Horror 3rd Edition is try it before you buy it. Um, you may get a kick out of it, but there are better Fantasy Flight Cthulhu games on the market. Thank you once again for joining us today on the Discriminating Gamer. As always, I ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on the DiscriminatingGamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are the Discriminating Gamer, and I... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Uber? You want to order me?